Good afternoon. Uh, I wanted uh, first, for those of you who are uh, visitors here today, I'm Isla Berman, I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture. Uh, I wanted to tell you two things before uh, I introduce uh, David Ajay uh, as our medalist. Uh, first, that this group of seats down here in the front are not reserved. So if any of you are up there wondering about that, that's the answer to that question. Um, and the second, and although looking out at you, I'm a little nervous to say this, we're having a reception at Pavilion 6 after the lecture, and you're all invited in the garden. Uh, so I, uh, I will start with that. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to actually present the citation uh, that uh, uh, was presented uh, to David Ajay today. Uh, so for those of you that were there, I apologize for the repetition, uh, but it, it, it is truly my honor to introduce Sir David Ajay as our 53rd recipient of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medal in Architecture. Named among Time's 100 Most Influential People in the World, and knighted uh, in 2017 by Queen Elizabeth II for his services to architecture, Ajay is truly one of the most uh, prominent and creative designers of his generation. He's the lead design architect for the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC, one of the most important works of architecture of this century. Beyond its tremendous uh, social, cultural, and educational significance, this project speaks to the power of architecture through its strong symbolic and physical presence to house, embody, and give a voice to the histories that have remained buried for many years uh, since this nation's founding. In contrast to the white neoclassical buildings along the mall, this museum is seemingly a dark, solitary monolith the materialization of a shadow of American history that is insistently solid, yet also ephemeral, as light is modulated across its permeable membrane, a very intricately crafted bronze-colored skin. Despite the building's unique corona form, which is an abstraction of the Yoruba carved columns and a counterpoint to the capitals that are visible uh, on Jefferson's rotunda, the museum draws deeply from architectural roots in Africa and throughout the African diaspora in the American South. It is an astounding and sublime jewel. It is a long-awaited treasure for the nation as a whole. If there is something that ties uh, Sir David Ajay to Thomas Jefferson, it is their shared belief that architecture has the potential to affect positive social change in the world. Jefferson's academical village was designed with this intention. Now, as we recognize the many gaps, erasures, and untold stories hidden below this institution's and this nation's histories, we look to people such as Ajay to help us reveal them, to embody them in an architecture that will give them an enduring life, spirit, and meaning. As a Ghanaian British architect born in Tanzania and educated in the UK, Ajay's work, such as the Ghana National Cathedral in Accra, have taken him back to the continent of his birth, while he has also been called upon to take on projects within the diaspora. These include the Stephen Lawrence Centre in London, designed in memory of a black teenager who was a victim of a racially motivated murder, and other important social and cultural projects uh, for African-American communities, such as the Sugar Hill Affordable Housing Project, and the Studio Museum, both in Harlem. He has also focused attention on documenting the dynamic history, geography, politics, and urbanism of modern Africa through the evolution of 53 African cities and towns. The ambition to undertake the documentation of the built environment of an entire continent uh, is seemingly implausible, unthinkable, and yet it is truly inspiring and highly commendable. This decade-long study was published as a seven-volume book, Ajay Africa Architecture, in 2011, and exhibited as Urban Africa at London's Design Museum. For Ajay, architecture is a beautiful, powerful, and poetic medium, 
One cannot help but sense this when looking at the intensely chromatic and patterned skins, the material surfaces, and sculptural forms of so many of his works. These are architectures whose influences far exceed the limitations of their own disciplinary history, drawing their inspiration from a wide range of media and confluence of cultures. On behalf of the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, it is my privilege to introduce Sir David Ajay, the 2018 recipient of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medal in Architecture. to finally have come to this campus that I've admired for very, very long. Um, and um, I can't think of a better way than to have come, obviously, <laughs> to receive this medal. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about three projects and, in a way, um, uh, use that to maybe have a discussion. The three projects are, on, uh, uh, are, are really trying to look at three different uh, types of architecture um, that really are all uh, connected to public life in cities and public life um, in nations uh, for, for, uh, as a national idea. And um, it's a theme that I'm continually exploring and evolving through and in a way the, the three projects embody three ways of looking at those thematics through the lens of the places. And, and three different results uh, sort of uh, uh, offered as ways to uh, think about those conditions. The first project is the Studio Museum in Harlem, um, which is a project um, uh, commissioned by um, the, this incredible institution that has um, uh, been uh, in, uh, it's really a 20th century institution that is was really founded to deal with the, um, the, the erasure of uh, uh, African-American -Ameri African artists from the canon and the trajectory uh, of American art and the way it's told in its, in, in, its, uh, in, its, uh, in its history books, which is changing now. But the Studio Museum really was founded as a way to create a resistance to that erasure and to support artists with a studio program that would um, incubate them and allow them to be um, pre better prepared for the commercial environment to allow them to have success in long, sort of long um, artistic careers. Sort of after 50 years after it started in a sort of small shop and home, it is now um, a very important um, uh, institution, but now needs to grow. And um, uh, this, at, at its sort of at this moment in time, it is now going to become um, a very important cultural anchor in the. Uh, in Harlem on 125th Street, probably one of the most important streets in Harlem, um, supported by um, the previous administration, um, the previous um, administration of, de Blas um, of Bloomberg, and now de Blasio, both mayors, really seeing this as a very important anchor project and a kind of growth of the public life of that uh, of the northern part of Manhattan. Um, the site is in um, is in Harlem, as I said, and it's and its architecture and um, iconography is, is world famous. Um, the sort of incredible boulevards which were built, as you know, Harlem was really the high point of the island. You know, uh, downtown is really, um, and uh, the sort of Wall Street is really the lowest point and it really is a kind of incredible imp uh, inclined plane that rises. And Harlem really is that sort of bucolic part which used to actually be full of farms, um, no, no more than sort of 90 years ago um, and has really become this very important residential um, enclave. Um, it was also the enclave which um, uh, sort of during the sort of early part of the century also right through to the middle part became the sort of ghetto for the segregation of, um, of communities. The African American community really were, became the kind of anchor sort of community in that neighborhood and in a way developed and um, sort of um, 
sort of evolved and created a kind of a, a culture which has become one that is influencing the world, one where a kind of what I call a kind of Afro-modernism is born, a sort of, a sort of an incredible Afro-modernist movement in literature, in the arts, in the political life. Um, this is one of the centers where this happens. And, and it happens in theaters, um, the sort of the, the theater becoming a kind of very important space of that sort of public, public discourse and public life. Um, obviously, uh, the chapels and churches which are converted buildings or purpose-built buildings, um, eclectic in their kind of formal language, but really a kind of a sort of landscape of a certain uh, scale that sort of encourages and incubates that public life. And then obviously the extraordinary architecture of the residential um, uh, stock with its sort of um, street wall, um, street edge defining sort of architecture. And I sort of show these three to really try and tell you a little bit about the sort of you know, almost condensed set of influences that are uh, were very sort of uh, influential on me in thinking about it and um, really thinking about these images. This is the first studio museum site, which is really a shop. This is the opening, the opening this is the founding members. Um, and really, it was a shop with a sort of studio up above um, in Harlem. And just really thinking about the evolution of Harlem from the 20s right through to now. Um, this is, and this is Harlem now, and this is the Studio Museum. The building that they were given is this building here, right across from the State Department sort of tower that was built on 125th. Uh, the Apollo is just down here, and this is the building, which was an old bank building, which um, had tenants up above it, and has been kind of iteratively refurbished and failed because of the sort of minimal refurbishments that were required to sort of take it another 10 years into the future, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the last one was a kind of cosmetic um, uplift of its front front face and um, and they really are now at the edge of, of all that and you know, it's amazing that they have now been able to kind of transform um, that asset into um, the project that it will become now. This is 125th. And what's amazing about the uh, site is that it's a tr through block to 124th. So really it's a, a sort of bar that um, is, is cutting between a sort of residential street, 124th is very much a residential street, and 125th, which is the civic public life of, of, of the sort of main boulevard of Harlem. And um, in a way, an early sketch, which was done after a lot of walking and a lot of talking, which wasn't meant to be uh, anything more than a, but a sort of a response was this idea of um, really the notion of this stacked set of programs, really an institution which, you know, has been built into it, the production of art as well as the, um, the sort of consumption of art. And, and there was something very beautiful about that for me, um, that there are not many institutions, most institutions are archival, institutions or, um, you know, uh, contemporary institutions was really about the kind of consumption, but in a way there's a kind of uh, cycle in this which was about um, education, now being very important to all institutions, very much to this one, education, production, um, and consumption, and a sort of active, sort of digestive system that kind of really uh, contributes to the public life of, of the neighborhood, but also now the city and internationally. I sort of wanted to show you the section that was developed um, sort of um, a couple of years almost after that initial sketch, which in the end um, sort of attempted to digest uh, a way by which um, the idea of the kind of uh, what I call the scales of spaces of Harlem are being condensed um, into a narrative about uh, a place to display art. So um, in a way the, the the obvious thing is that the reverse stoop of every neighborhood is, is turned into a grand reverse stoop into the institution rather than out. Um, there is no auditorium. This, this stoop becomes the public arena and heart and is placed uncomfortably into the center of the building. You sort of uh, bridge over to its lobby, 
which becomes a kind of Juliet balcony to that auditorium and back to the street. And then, um, uh, as sort of as a reverse, maybe to the way in which uh, museums use elevators, a very, very large monumental staircase is placed in a shaft, which brings light down to its center, um, uh, to, to take you up to workshops, galleries, studios, teaching spaces, offices, and finally a roof terrace, which allows you to orientate yourself um, uh, in this uh, sort of unique uh, spot in the city. So in a way, the section is really driving the idea. And, um, and this notion of the scales of different kind of spaces from 40 feet to 30 feet to 20 feet to 16 feet are sort of being modulated across this. So in a way, also the idea of the kind of scales of the public experience are being kind of reframed. And then in plan, I mean, I've clustered them all together because I don't want you to study them too much, but essentially it is <laughs> essentially three bars. There's a service system that disconnects from the party wall, a bar, which is all the servicing, and then the rooms, which are in between, and then there are sort of four thresholds, one, which is the entrance sequence, um, galleries, um, etc., the atriums, and the sort of second set of galleries and back of house. And that really is the kind of organizational system. And then the detail of that is sort of articulated as you go through it. And, and this is the elevation that's going to be built, um, that you get um, an aggregation um, or a crumpling of a sort of series of volumes that start off almost like a pediment um, and then dissolve and sort of ero erode to create a kind of very permeable ground plane um, a sort of almost dissolve with the street, um, which is an incredible bustling street, but a kind of way in which the museum wants to engage and dissolve that street into its context and engage with it um, programmatically as well as just visually. And then the, the different programs, the education spaces with the children's window, um, a privileging children's window, the studio spaces with clear story, northern light, the, the education spaces as a window to the community that's very transparent. Um, seeing artists working, seeing classrooms happening as a kind of the primary lens, um, galleries and offices, and then the, um, the uh, roof terrace um, up above. And there's sort of an indicular to allow, I mean, there's sort of several indicular framing systems to kind of allow public sculpture to be curated um, on the building or to, um, or to have it as uh, interventions an artist can make. Um, this idea that the building comes down um, and then sort of breaks apart and the programs break apart and dissolve and become diaphanous really becomes the sort of key move and then you sort of are invited into it uh, is, 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 is a kind of the important study that uh, the project has set up. We worked with the city because this is one of the few cultural buildings on 125th, which is essentially Commercial Street, where we argued that we wanted uh, the zoning to, be to allow us to, to basically cantilever over the street as much as 15, 20 feet, um, uh, 15 feet, and to be able to recess as much as 20, 20 feet, something that you're not allowed to do because of the zoning. But we argued that this was going to be a commercial building that needed to articulate its presence on the street beyond just having a sheer wall, which is a requirement by code in most buildings in New York. So that was a kind of very special um, discussion and then this idea of a, a masonry building that uses um, a, a black marble as its aggregate base um, which is polished in the lenses and rough on the its perimeter so the sort of the frames the sort of the, each each program is sort of as it were articulated as a as a material volume with um, polished and blasted matte sort of textures and that articulates itself all the way up the building. When you come in, you're, you're, you're almost thrown straight into the stoop, and this becomes the kind of programmatic heart, um, and the waiting area, the arrival into the museum is straight into the, the stoop, and then uh, the, the passage to buy tickets, etc. happens, and then the staircase, this is uh, 30 feet, so each flight is 15 feet. So it's, it's hard to explain the scale, but the idea is that um, unlike the sort of the, the idea of the museum with the staircase tucked away, we wanted to create the idea of the ascent as a kind of very um, uh, visible sort of 
passaggia, as, you know, using the Italian word, uh, a kind of passaggia, a vertical passaggiata that sort of rises up the building, uh, delivering you to different programs. And we're sort of wanting you to encourage people to walk. And uh, the stair becomes a kind of device which has been developed where there are seats and rest points and sort of viewpoints from it to then rise up the building. So it peers, it peers in, it creates rest points, it creates large moments for hanging out, it creates kind of semi-auditorium spaces at the base um, and becomes this kind of monolithic sculptural moment um, that also allows you to see a view of a work by Fiesta Gates, which is really the reconstitution of the demolished building into a, a panel that rises the sort of entire shaft of the building. So as you're rising, you're seeing the old studio museum and the new studio museum in this, in this kind of composition. You enter into galleries which are sometimes um, uh, scaled for the works, uh, 16 feet being the smallest scale to allow paintings and works on paper to sort of comfortably operate through the stairs, through to larger spaces, which are as much as 30 feet at its apex, vaulted rooms that allow for large sculptural works to be able to be displayed. And then straight off those galleries, uh, the public is able to go into the studio spaces of the artists if they allow you to come in. They can shut off their doors if they want, but, but there are these studio spaces with their northern lights and uh, up to six artists can be working in these spaces. And then also from that to the um, the, teaching, uh, the teaching and education spaces, which have uh, deliberately a window that is only low, um, and it's really about sitting and looking down into the city and really for, you know, kids up to sort of 10 to be able to look directly sort of down. And then from there you take another stair which takes you up to a roof terrace which then connects and gives you this sort of two framed uh, sort of systems, one which frames the view down to Manhattan and the other which frames the view to Upper, upper Harlem. And, and, and that sort of rear elevation. I'll kind of show you a video of it, so that will take you through, because I've taken you through a lot of slides, but in a, in a strange way, the animation, which was developed for the client to understand the building is a, a kind of way to see how uh, the experience of the building uh, works.
was. I stopped it earlier, but you got the event, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the next, so in a way, that, that project is about to start on site and will be three years in the making of, and will finish in 2021. Um, the next project is really the, the project that took a, a decade of my studio. Um, it's taken more or less 10 years to do this, nine years, but 10 years by the time we completed everything. And that was to, to build the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's a competition uh, that um, we, it was an open invitation that um, a dear a friend of mine who was, uh, I would consider probably one of the deans of African American, um, African American architects in this country, Max Bond, uh, reached out to me as a young architect uh, many years ago and invited me to, to give my first lecture in America um, at Harvard. And um, sort of we kept in touch after that. And when this competition, many years later, so a decade year, later, when this competition came about, I called him and um, we, we talked about wanting to collaborate. And he um, already was in a, a partnership with a, an incredible architect called Phil Freelon. And um, we decided that actually, rather than forming two different groups, that we should join together to make, um, as Max would say, a kind of new jazz group um, where they would be different you know, uh, he, he, he liked it to sort of a Miles Davis kind of, kind of ensemble or John Coltrane's ensemble. And, you know, he was going to be the godfather, you know, that would be the sort of design guarantor. Um, I was the sort of the young upstart who was going to lead the design. And um, Phil was uh, the sort of experienced architect who could deliver this project at the scale um, so that was this kind of thinking, and we'd you know each have our you know our sort of moments, but that was the kind of, and it would sort of show a sort of uh, uh, a, a sort of excellence, um, and really kind of talk about excellence um, at its highest level. Sadly, um, uh, Max passed away before we presented the project. He, he got he got, um, he got cancer, and um, but he he saw my studies before he passed away. So it was incredibly tragic, uh, and then we won. Um, um, so it was a sort of tragic sort of beginning, but also one where, in a way, he's, he's been the sort of spiritual force in the project, as I always say, um, in terms of uh, guiding the sort of the focus. The National Museum of African American History and Culture comes at the end of a sort of, sort of incredible plan of building cultural institutions on the Washington Mall. Um, it, uh, it, it completes a 200-year plan by L'Enfant, um, Jefferson and L'Enfant. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Jefferson instructed L'Enfant about the building of Washington, and um, L'Enfant went to Paris, looked at neoclassical architecture, designed uh, DC based on these diagonals, and um, then obviously uh, built this incredible diagram, which is subsequently updated, but essentially is the L'Enfant plan, which is the mall with all its cultural palaces, and then the memorial grounds with all its uh, memorials uh, to the nation. The, the history of African American museums are, are, is, uh, is a kind of an, another interesting institution which has always been in the background and mostly has been sort of, uh, there are 200 of them in little houses up and down the country, but always mostly private. These are the collection of sort of the most prominent uh, ones that were built um, to try and deal with this story not being engaged in the mainstream. And probably the largest and most prominent is the museum in uh, Michigan, uh, built in 1965 as the kind of most prominent uh, sort of African-American museum. Um, and in a way, each of these museums has tried to wrestle with the narrative of the story, a 200-year story. Um, and. Um, what they've all essentially done at their heart is to create narratives which are based on a kind of um, a, a, a remaking, a sort of a, 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 a sort of way to use um, wax dummies and, um, and sort of uh, storytelling to try and bring people through a sort of very strict linear narrative. Um, when the Smithsonian, um, you know, 
finally were able to kind of make this happen through people like Congressman John Lewis, who's been instrumental in, in making this happen and put together this incredible board, Lonnie Bunch, the director, um, you know, had, when we won the competition, we, we finally started to talk. A couple of things became very clear. This was going to be a museum where every artifact would be real, that the narrative could support, they could be sort of, um, sort of figures, etc. but they would always be not realistic. They would be neutralized into a sort of plane, um, uh, sort of to be clear that they were not trying to represent some kind of reality, um, but they were symbols to deal with information, but all the artifacts that were supporting the narratives had to be real. And when they started, Lonnie had um, 3,000 objects, which um, for a Smithsonian would not be enough. Uh, so uh, his argument was that he believed that the community um, uh, would give and that the museum obviously would, uh, through its board, would raise money to buy um, as many uh, things as it could. What's extraordinary is that in that decade, um, and when the museum sort of finally got its mandate, uh, which was given through, um, it's a kind of cross-party, I, I always say this project is really a cross-party project in the sense that the land was given by, uh, was made possible uh, because Congress was arguing um, that the land was made possible by um, a pres one of the presidential gifts of, you know, you have this great tradition of presidents able to do things at the end of their tenure. So um, actually President Bush, uh, um, chose the land. Uh, Laura Bush, uh, who was on the board, was instrumental in making sure that this piece of land, this last piece of land was given to the museum because there were a lot of discussions about the museum not being on the mall um, and they were gaining traction. So that was an incredible focus. And then uh, President Obama um, really uh, making sure that Congress delivered on its promise to give it the funding that it required to build this museum very quickly and to expedite the speed at which the funding could come through to allow us to build uh, this building in under a decade, which is the fastest building ever built on the Moor, which was um, astonishing to me because it was <laughs> I was hoping we'd get it done in five and uh, everybody laughed at me and I now realize why with the white hairs that I have in my face it's because of this project. <laughs> um, this museum really tries to make the, the history of the invisibility visible. Um, but also um, questions that come up um, about, you know, how could I be chosen as the, la the lead designer in this team? Why, why would I be given that responsibility? And I always love to show this image of um, my father worked for this man, who's the man who liberated, was more or less credited with liberating the continent of Africa. He was part of his administration, one of his ambassadors. Um, and I grew up understanding the sort of the, the struggle of that sort of mid 20th century um, sort of decolonization from Africa, civil rights in America as one struggle and one modernity that was exploding. Um, so the narratives were absolutely clear to me, and you could see, you know, obviously you recognize this man, that this is in Accra. Um, so the, the, the kind of relationship between um, the struggle for the civil rights and the founding of the freedom of the continent of Africa are intimately linked, so sharing intelligence and processes and Nkrumah and King shared many sort of uh, ideas that allowed them to gain the successes that they made and those narratives are embedded in that generation. Uh, the thinking was that the artifacts that um, the museum needed would come from the community and because it was a narrative, because it is a narrative museum, um, and also a new museum, a new kind of museum, it wasn't about necessarily the preciousness of the objects, but really the, the significance to the narrative and the significance to the community. So everything from the first voting slips through to Rosa Parks' dress, of course, traumatic things like slave shackles, or, you know, a a sort of portrait of Harriet Tubman, one of the few portraits that we have of her, are all part of the collection of, of pieces in the museum. And um, what the museum now has after 10, uh, after ten years is, uh, they, from 3,000 objects, they now have uh, 40,000 objects. So that really just happened by going into the communities um, 
and, and people offering things that they've held on to for generations um, to then wait for a space where they could um, finally um, sort of give over this responsibility to the institution. So th that is, in itself for me is a really powerful story and one that's been incredible to watch uh, because it really was a kind of building with no artifacts essentially um, to opening with a building with um, as much as any other institution. The latent sort of build-up in society. Um, the project sort of really is a sort of, I guess, a meditation on many parts of the story, but some of the kind of central um, areas uh, that I that sort of really focused the attention was to really look at the the 400-year history of the slave trade and to understand where it really manifested profoundly. Um, and it's really West and Central Africa um, that the sort of, the slaves that survived, 12 million slaves um, came to the continent of America, North and South. Um, how many were taken, how many were lost is not known uh, fully um, uh, at a time when populations were incredibly low. Um, and some of the slaves even came from as far down as Madagascar and what is now Mozambique. Um, of the sort of approximately 12 million, 9 million slaves actually went to South America. So the biggest diaspora, African diaspora, is actually in South America. And that's the kind of story that needs to, I think, um, become clearer. Um, and then the Caribbean has approximately 3 million, just under 3 million, um, Sort of African uh, Africans who were brought from mostly Central and West Africa, and then America actually it was really came into its prime really at the end of the trade. So the European trade really was really concentrated on the farms in South America, and then as they became difficult to manage because of the wars, um, the Caribbean, and then finally um, uh, America, which essentially uh, I think the number is something like 396,000 slaves, just under 400,000. Under half a million slaves were actually brought to America. Um, so uh, it's, it's interesting. Usually people don't understand the, the way in which the numbers play out. Um, but it's this influence of Central West Africa which became very important. And we got this map from the Du Bois Institute who, who made this map from information correlated by the Mormons. Um, Mormon merchants who kind of documented um, their, their produce, slaves' produce, products, um, meticulously through records. So we know these numbers um, because it was, it was the economic livelihood of, of many communities. Um, because of that, understanding that kind of lens, um, it, it sort of became interesting to me uh, in terms of a design narrative to, to see if one could imagine um, a, a future where colonization hadn't happened um, of the continent and the slave trade hadn't happened and if the sort of uh, the, the cultures of the communities of West and Central Africa had been allowed to evolve their own modernity, um, what would have happened? And in a way, that's the kind of the, the fiction, the made-up story in my mind, um, but but one which is based on a, a way, uh, an observational uh, sort of analysis of the, and really the analysis is of the artifacts that were not taken to, uh, that were not destroyed, um, but are some of them that are real, that are still there now in Benin. And to really look at that period, uh, that sort of 15th century to, to the sort of early 20th century, um, and to, uh, and to really understand uh, at that time the kind of cultures that were permeating the arts and crafts and, and were sort of at the high point. I mean, before the colonization of the continent, um, Africa was aggregating into four empires, four or five empires. Um, it had moved past a notion of sort of nation and, and sort of small states and was really aggregating into these like, metropolitan centers. And Nigeria had become what is now modern Nigeria, but that area had become a very important um, sort of empire. And the Yoruba, who are the sort of great artistic sort of group in that region, undoubtedly dominated um, production of bronze casting right from the 11th century through to carving, 
in the uh, 15th century right through to now. Uh, so they mastered um, how to kind of make, exp express their arts and, um, and they were in the forest region. That area was predominantly forest even at, at that time. And so wood carving became a kind of, you know, uh, what I call supernatural wood carving where um, incredible narratives are kind of brought from the notion of the forest are permeated everywhere. And a lot of shrines were built as a result of that artistic uh, production and being in this incredible forest. Um, the shrines exist today. You can go to Benin and you can see some of these shrines um, and uh, they're fascinating. Anyway, there were master craftsmen that were in, were the sacred sort of makers of those shrines. And one that is, uh, that fascinated me because he, there was quite a bit of information on him was um, Olu of Ize, a very important master carver who traces his lineage back 10 generations through stories. Um, that talks about the family always being the kind of shrine carvers for the kings. Um, said that this form was given to him by his father and it was given to his great-grandfather and this form was a form that was very important um, as a kind of uh, caryatid. It's a, it's a Corinthian, I call it a Corinthian capital that happens again and again and again in these shrine houses. And I became fascinated with this, the stories about this and the way in which each column is a caryatid to a particular dynasty or an important story or an important narrative that the society concretizes as an important lesson um, to advance its, its civilization. I became really fascinated by this idea of a kind of language that people didn't realize kind of existed, which was a specific codification, and that anyone from that period of the 15th century would have understood that, um, because this artistic production that was happening in the Yoruba kingdoms spread throughout West Africa, right through to Senegal, right down to Angola. It really is the artistic, uh, I think, um, genesis of all the mutations that you see um, through all the different tribes that sort of spread. And I think that for me, that's a better way of understanding what some people call primitive art, uh, which it's really not. It's really about a kind of artistic idea which then permeates and then evolves a kind of specificity in each region. Um, but its high point is really understood to have been from this region. Um, this is a thesis that a lot of scholars are kind of working on now. It's, but, uh, it's a very important one. And by the 15th century, this group embraces with empire abstraction. So unlike the way you probably think about it, this is not the beginning of sort of, you know, a way to try and make excellent figuration. This is the beginning of collapsing excellent figuration, which happens in the 11th and 10th century. Um, if you know the kind of Benin bronzes, they, are, they go back to the 9th, 10th, 11th century. They're incredibly realistic bronzes, which look like the figures are going to move. These are hand cast things. That's rejected by the 15th century when this empire clustering is happening and abstraction becomes the, the sort of m the method of creating a creative uh, sort of output. And I, I think that's really important to always understand that what you think of as primitivism is actually a way to concretize very dense information into bodies which are no longer literal or trying to express ideas through a literal um, expression, but are really codified through a series of forms which have in each of their parts meaning that each culture understands. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of tablet of information. Um, I have been fascinated by this DNA and uh, felt that that maybe kind of provided a root source to try and understand how to explain that to the community that loses it when it comes to America because it's stripped of that ability to read that language. But um, somehow I believe that the language is in, is inbuilt into the, into, the, into the system, into the experience. And I think that even memories are somehow transmitted in our genes somehow, you know, somebody will find out one day, <laughs> that it's somehow in there, that there's a kind of latent sort of system. And in a way, the project's maybe a test of that. Um, the community of slavery is not just about supporting large farming communities, it's also, or cultivating communities is also about building infrastructure. It literally is the workforce that builds canals, builds bridges, builds architecture, learns how to use the industrialized sort of processes of the north of Boston, etc. But when they come to the south, there are not so many factories. Slaves learn how to cast in sand, sand casting, and make extraordinary works. This is a sand cast, iron work. It's, it's literally made by hand. 
um, and I became very fascinated by that as a, as a, as a way to then talk about the African-American experience in, uh, from after, after coming in from Africa. This craft, this metal excellence, this wood excellence, and this building excellence is still in this community who've been stripped of everything and they literally start building America. Um, the site is, this is the Longform Plan, so this is really the, the mall, and this is the Washington Memorial Grounds, and this is the last site. Um, all the other sites are really triple that size, and in a way, these were meant to be gatehouses at this end, and the palaces of culture were supposed to be here. Um, so it, for many years, many, many, many people thought that the site was the worst site, and that it was a kind of, it was not right to give it such a small site. But, uh, but in a way, it is not about the palaces, but in a way, it's about the way in which, for me, it sort of finishes a sentence that's almost the full stop or the exclamation mark. And it, in a very strange way, it is at the core of a, mon of a monumental cross plan, and it acts as a kind of panoptic lens to the entire landscape, and that was very pro profound to me, that it's a, kind of, it becomes a panoptic system uh, that really kind of allows you to see everything from Congress, the National Archive, the Mall, Wash, uh, White House, uh, Lincoln, uh, now Martin Luther King, Washington, Jefferson, these cardinal sort of artifacts that organize the monumental core. So the building really for me was about seeing if there was this ability to aggregate these two um, dis disjunctures, labor, um, culture, crafts from Africa, labor in America, and this location. Um, and to use the building as a kind of living system, not just a shell container, but a living system that would facilitate and mediate be, uh, between going into exhibition space, peering through to the city and the artifacts that constitute the kind of democracy that you have now, and then um, being able to then dive deep and come next to something which might be a piece of legislation or a document or a form and understanding that through the lens of the city and to try and say that the, the city is alive and all continually changing and growing and that the building is also participating in that discourse and the exhibits are participating in it. In a way that the, the, the activation is happening all the way down. It's not the container and the contained. It's not that kind of museum anymore. It's not that enlightenment model of um, a palace of edification, it is a journey of discovery and learning. Um, so this, this, this juncture, I really wanted to celebrate. So the, this, the, 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 the outside, there are many layers of the building. It almost scales itself in. The outside is the, the karyatid head, which is really the, the, the crowning narrative of the story. Uh, of any karyatid story, it's the kind of celebration of that. Um, but also, in a weird way, for me, it, it allowed the building to have these layers. I, I said that the building would not have a core center, they would always radiate out. It would act not like a chamber, but like a tree. So it's really, it's, it's, it radiates out, it has a core, a stable center, and it creates branches to the landscape. So. It has the skin, the outside is kind of the foliage, as it were, the, the pavilion. 50% of the building is underground, which becomes history. The circulation is always on the perimeter. You're not able to sort of circulate in the center. And the exhibition spaces are the center and the sort of underground space. So I hope that makes it clear. Um, the site is a five acre site and on a sort of Beaux-Arts plan. We allowed the Beaux-Arts plan to sort of dissolve, but to, to connect and keep desire lines, these were paths that people had started to use from the Oval of the White House through the site, and we kind of wanted to almost register those paths as the sort of landscape study, and Catherine Gustafsson and, his, and her team were amazing in interpreting that, that the building has, sits on top of the layering of the site itself and its sort of desire paths, and then creates by its placement a front and uh, not a back, but two sort of landscapes, a sort of southern and a northern exposure with two different qualities, the northern exposure being a larger space that allows you to get visitors and sight lines to Lincoln as you approach it from the White House or from the Federal Triangle. Um, and then the south, creating a sort of porch 
space that takes you from the sort of hot summer sun into this sort of building. And the building being a, uh, a form which receives everyone. It's At its ground plane, it's meant to be when it's not busy and normalizes. <laughs> it will be a sort of space that you can just walk through without going down. Um, it's not that now because it's, it's very, very busy at the moment. <laughs> um, it's a five acre site and the history galleries are on the northern side to take uh, to use that aspect and the southern aspects underground is where the sort of back of house and loading is the building is uh, placed on four monumental cores it's a 210 foot pavilion up above ground and then it's supported on four monumental cores which have everything in them services systems are all running through that and the structure is braced to that as a series of trusses so that we can have free span exhibition spaces. So it divides it into three um, in, all co in, in four directions. So the plan above ground from the batteries is this sort of moment where the paths cross through, uh, one bypassing the building, one taking going through the building. The four cores are here and this becomes a kind of giant lobby that you come into and you're drawn to the northern part of the building where you then see the sort of section of the plan where you look 40 feet down and you know 180 feet up which is the sort of sight line and then the west is where you take the uh, escalators up or you can take uh, also in the western core the, eleva um, the uh, elevators up and down the exhibition space the east has a kind of orientation space and security is dealt with in that sort of southern eastern corner exhibition spaces are up above sort of organized between the cores and then offices are right at the top of the building allowing the sort of plan to then use the roof lights to illuminate the deep plan space it's a 210 foot box this is kind of section looking at it with um, washington's monument it goes down 80 feet and it rises 180 feet up in the air and matches the site the strict uh, sort of building height line of Washington. The building sort of east-west, sort of, that's the sort of 80 feet descent, that's the loading docks, this is the northern exposure. This entire site is in a swamp, that the mall is really a backfill swamp, which was extraordinary to find out. And we were actually right on the, <laughs> on the, uh, on the sort of canal that was uh, uh, sort of used from the Potomac River to bring stone to build um, Congress. So um, there was a lot of uh, anxiety in digging this and of course it delayed us a year. We did, we went down thinking we were okay and then we struck a water table which rushed right up and uh, caused the year's delay as we created um, a sort of second retaining system around this uh, site um, and the incredible discoveries. We also then um, in doing this, realized something which I'll speak about later, that this northern exposure was also the site of a slave market. The skin of the building, which is this, uh, it's sort of inspired by this Yoruba motif, um, has in its sort of, uh, in its detail, uh, the, the idea of labor, the celebration of African-American labor, physically building the country. And it, it's, it's done through the, uh, the lens of looking at um, uh, uh, this beautiful piece of ironwork that we found in Charleston that was um, made by a blacksmith slave. And I, I literally didn't want to design this. Um, and and I, 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 at one point, even just wanted to kind of just remake the form, but decided that actually I wanted to just um, do something that are hopefully architects do, just to reveal the DNA and the skill of this piece of work by mapping its horizontal and vertical kind of axis. In a way, you map a portrait of somebody when you're drawing them, you make the points, the cardinal points, and you sort of map the triangles and then you fill it in as you draw, those of you who've done, been to art school. So it's in a way a sort of mapping of the sort of the intelligence of this work. And that makes the network, which then makes the system, which then densifies to 80% um, um, or um, 40% density, and then allows um, a language to be made whereby the building is absolutely acknowledging its cardinal directions, even though it looks like a homogenous system. Um, it is um, a device where uh, transparency 
is red, the most transparent, sort of 40% elements, and that's really on the northern exposure. It's the greatest amount. Where people are, we, we, we reduce, we use transparency, and when we are not purple, we intensify the experience of the lenses, which look to those nine cardinal views that I described right at the beginning. They frame those specifically and allow those to be engaged with the museum content. Um, and then the building really is a sort of, sort of becomes in the end this matrix. This is actually what reveals what the building is, is that it's this network of transparency and opacity, um, which is then sort of illustrated in the sort of elevations. We made countless elevations to try and explain this to our client, because before you can build it, trying to tell a client that this sort of translucency was not easy, and these are huge drawings, which you've got to make to try and explain these um, with these sort of special lenses. And that sort of that's that sort of density, the layering, the sort of filigree within the filigree is part of the dynamism that makes the building kind of activate and catch light and have transparencies and and uh, sort of opacities that that sort of surprise. And that's that sort of that, that took a lot of work to to make happen. This is the building within its, within its context when in the winter, which I really love from a helicopter, where you see how it sits within this context. Um, and I also love this image where you see sort of white stone buildings of Washington and this is our building here. Um, this, the building is, it works as a building within a building. The environmental, the, the skin is an environmental filter. Um, it's a gold leads building on the mall. Um, um, we collect all our water. It does, does all the things that allow it to become sort of the first sustainable, the first leads building on the mall. Um, and the, uh, the building within the building um, creates an environmental buffer and a security buffer so that that skin is almost like a dress where it can withstand a blast from a, a mortar attack close by. So it's also a kind of cage which kind of collects the energy and dissipates it away from the core. Um, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things happening today. <laughs> I know that one. And the the the, 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 the Mac might close. Are you okay with that? <laughs> sure, Mac might sleep soon. <laughs> you don't want that. To <laughs> oh yeah, it just came up. Oh okay, that was probably me. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, the building within its context. <laughs> That's our building right there. I'll just take you through a series of vignettes which just really place it within its context. There it is there. This is a good one. There it is right there. And then sort of very close by, with sort of looking at its photovoltaic cells and its roof and its skylights. From Washington's monument, Laurie Olin's amazing rethinking of the Beaux-Arts plan. And just looking at it on its southern facade and how it captures the light. The building is really a light register because it's actually perfectly set. It's north, south, east, west. It, it's exactly on the, on the cardinal um, sort of views and that was very important to me. And the plan of the lobby is about that. The ability to go into a lobby space where you get the four cardinal lights. Something you guys take for granted here because your beautiful rotunda has a um, collection of windows which give you every light, um, which is a magical thing for an architecture, I think. Um, sort of approaching it, the way in which the canopy is a disengaged form that creates, we developed this so that it's a, sort of an amazing piece of engineering excellence. P. Nordson sort of designed this bridge, uh, 210 foot cantilever with a 70 foot sort of uh, projection, which is angled at a particular angle with a water feature that we introduced to create a microclimate that reduces the temperature by eight degrees in peak summer uh, temperature by using flowing and still water and using evaporative cooling um, from that heat and the angle of the, of the, of the form, we're able to uh, create this microclimate underneath the building. So this thing with a kind of water plane that's exactly that way. And then it's disconnected to allow heat buildup to then rise and, and release itself, but also architecturally to create a gateway that the porch is a sort of almost a gateway to the building at the same time. So when you're right next to it, it in the southern sun, it can be almost uh, as though it's in flame. This is not you know, this is not affected in any way. This is a real picture. Um, and then that sort of plane, when you 
come in and then the sort of disconnection of it. This is a, a kind of an extraordinary structure that we insisted, I insisted that he did not connect back to my, my book. <laughs> and he managed to do it. <laughs> not many people believed him. But, uh, so this becomes this extraordinary cool space, um, just using very traditional ideas that were developed in the South. And also a frame to Washington. This is the only porch space on the mall, so in the peak summer sun, it becomes this incredible <laughs> space where you see hundreds of people huddled underneath the porch, <laughs> not wanting to go under the sun, waiting for, I don't know, a break or clouds or something or to get into the building. It's been interesting to watch. And then when you enter, you see the skin between the main heart of the museum and the skin, which is actually a glass building, and then the lenses are these projections that go to that skin that are about the nine windows that I was talking to you about. So you see this, these projecting systems. This is the light, which is very important to me to somehow allow the public to register that you come into the space and you get these four lights. East light, um, west, west, east light, west light, north light, and southern light. And that you're able to see the kind of environment coming right into the building. It's a dark ceiling. It was originally meant to be a timber ceiling, but that's a different lecture. <laughs> and it has this dark bronze ceiling. And they, the reason was to really bring your eye level down so that you looked out towards the, the, these four large windows. And then you, uh, this is the northern exposure. And then you see the drop, which exposes the museum. Um, and you go down this large monumental stair, which goes down 40 feet without columns. Again, another set of amazing engineering feet by Guy. Um, uh, it bounced when we first put it in, <laughs> which was terrifying to everyone. And then dampness were put in, but uh, it, was, it was totally safe, but it bounced and it, it was very traumatic for a lot of people. <laughs> um, but it's this extraordinary descent down 40 feet to then get to the history galleries. Um, that's probably the most dramatic understanding of it. And it's sort of, um, I wanted to kind of make it a stair where it wasn't just a balustrade. It rises and descends. So you come in at a normal balustrade. By the time you get to this point, you're in a sort of serra like sort of canyon. And then um, it reveals itself back again at the bottom. So then you're forced to look up in the middle and you look at the views at the top and the bottom. You enter um, the museum through the history galleries. You go into a large room lift, which uh, Ralph Applebaum designed, which takes you down four centuries. And then you enter almost a kind of crypt, like compressed, very compressed space, um, which is very uh, much like the bowels of a ship, at almost um, sort of being in a kind of dark space. And then you sort of really see the unfolding of the colonization of the continent of Africa and the beginning of slavery. And then you come out of that sort of sequence into the Declaration of Independence, which is really the sort of beginning of the museum. It's a 200 year sort of narrative where you, you have Jefferson and, um, and his slaves um, and the Declaration of Independence as the beginning of the sort of struggle and the kind of idea of America. And that's in this soaring 80, 75 foot space. And at that moment, what we wanted to do, which you don't see in other museums, uh, was to reveal history um, as a kind of, uh, as a postmodern idea that you could see the 21st century and go back to the 18th century at the same time. And as I said, all the kind of dummies or reconstructions of people are neutralized as almost sculpture. And then everything that looks real is real and is an artifact. This is how much um, a farm, um, a sort of, cotton picker in the, in, in the fields would have to pick a day. That's a day's work right there. And just sort of somehow presenting true artifacts, true crosses, is I think part of the kind of power of the experience of the museum from seeing what slaves used as rings, you know, pieces of copper from brooms, etc. Or the segregation trains of the South. This is a real train that was rotting away and when the museum announced that it was making this museum there was a kind of incredible rush to donate it to refurbish it 
and we brought it in before the seating was made and could never go out and built the most extraordinary structure to support it. Um, um, slave houses were brought from the south. These are real houses that were taken apart and brought back. These are not reconstructions. And you sort of rise through these ramps where each period is then celebrated with a kind of um, a narrative which supports that. And um, this is a freed slave sort of home, sort of using timber architecture. These are these timber structures which are daubed with um, mud between them to, to create the insulation and the weatherproofing. Right through to the 20th century and the struggles of the civil rights. And just each time looking through the layers of the spaces was part of the architecture that we set up, that we wanted this architecture to always be overlapping. So you're looking at people, re looking at the lunch counter and then looking at, you know, um, the reconstruction trains and being able to go into them and experience that. But always it's overlapping and layering. You know, the Angola sort of um, guard tower, which killed so many African-Americans right through to the 20th century. This is a kind of a, one of the, the decommissioned prison. We brought the, the tower back um, and, and so forth. The Tuskegee training planes, which are, this is a World War I plane that was used by African-Americans in World War II um, to learn how to fly fighter planes, etc. So everything is really in front of you. And sort of in the heart of it is this space, this sort of in a dark copper laminated glass. And you get to that at the end after you've been through this narrative. Um, most people at the end of this are quite traumatic. So um, something that was developed during the uh, the design of the building was a space which I was very vocal about, was to create a pause before you rise up. And that pause also came because I also wanted to acknowledge the slave market that was on this side of the site, this is the northern side, and to create a space that you could then go and rest and respite um, through this um, Zimbabwe stone um, space. This is a kind of an amazing stone from Zimbabwe that uh, makes this kind of journey to this chamber, which is a 30-foot room with a waterfall, um, really using the words of uh, Martin Luther King, you know, we're determined to work, the next one is even better, to work and fight until justice runs down like water, righteousness like a mighty stream. And it was really the idea of seeing if we could use, make a room that encapsulated those words. So. Um, it's a deep ravine that is in a light, a lens of light, a cylinder, um, which I'll explain in a second. And the idea is that the water pours, you see a cascade of water, but you don't see where it goes when you're above. But when you're in this room, you see it cascading into this room and it makes an extraordinary sound, which silences you and hopefully makes a meditative restorative moment in this copper laminated glass chamber. And then you rise up. Up above, this is that lens, which in a way for me was about trying to make released from the ground the pedestal that slaves would have been sold on. Slaves are usually sold on blocks or stages. Um, and it's, in a strange way, it was to, to kind of activate that sense of it on this northern side, part of the site where we knew that information. So in a way, it's a sort of elevated stone which is, has this water releasing down and is trying to kind of talk about this narrative at this moment, um, that this, 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 this slave um, stone has been, has been released. Um, and then the museum has in its heart an auditorium, which is a kind of reverse of the building made out of um, uh, aluminium. And then you rise through it to the upper galleries, and you realize that the corona is a stepped uh, ziggurat of glass as well, going right up, which then takes you into the, the lit spaces. And this is the reason for the circulation being on the perimeter is that usually by the afternoon, it's on the western side, you are then in the sunlight and you're in the dancing light of the architecture, kind of creating a kind of extraordinary light dance on the built form. And you see those moments where the transparency has been expanded, the cage has been expanded, and you can see right through because your eyes are 
it's very sophisticated and can see through these things. <laughs> um, and then you go into exhibition spaces, you know, Applebaum spaces, uh, between artifacts, and always between spaces you get lens windows that frame very specific parts of Washington. If you look, you will understand and see what's going on. Jefferson's Dome is right there. So it's from, sorry, that window. Or Washington's Monument. And the angle of this window, which people think was just a kind of gesture, is nothing to do with that at all. It's really because this monument is so tall, and I wanted you to, at that moment when you're right next to it, be able to see the entire shaft. And because of the angle of our building and the monument, the angle had to be registered on the facade to allow this line to be straight. So it's really about that kind of perception, because otherwise it would have been at a diagonal across. If it was straight on the elevation, it would have been a diagonal across the monument. So that's what determines that geometry, which is the one sort of gesture um, and creates that lens to that moment. Up above in the upper galleries, you have culture and the arts, connecting back to Harlem, etc., Detroit, all those places, Oakland, the performing arts, um, the civil rights area, looking at Congress. This is the window to Congress, this is the window to the National Archive, it's right through to the visual arts. And then the last window, which is above the uh, window that frames uh, Washington is a kind of, uh, sorry, there's a window to the White House. <laughs> and then there's the window to the sort of monumental landscape of the Washington Memorial, uh, of the, sort of the memorial grounds as the sort of large panorama that you were able to go to to see this sort of privileged view of the landscape right to the Potomac. And then you have the education spaces, the offices with the skylights, boardrooms, etc., and this extraordinary terrace that frames um, the sort of city for the, for the offices and the, and the board. So that's the lens and the sort of angle that I was talking about and its relationship to the context. And then the building, sort of being at this junction between the sort of built fabric of, of Washington, the mall and the memorial grounds as a way of negotiating all those things. In a way, the building in the end for me became more than just a museum, it became a building which was a memorial, um, a museum and a sort of monument, really a three, three systems uh, being organized in one, and the way in which when the light is not on it, the coloration to when it is on it. This is when the evening sun is on it, and that was when the eastern sun is kind of activated. And then the way in which it dissolves, um, the way that the sort of arguments about transparency of the edges to create a kind of dissolve with the sky, um, whereas the light changes. And then the luminosity of it, which is not, um, we didn't want to make a building that light polluted more than it had to, you know, this, this is light pollution, but it's controlled. So what we did is that we organized all the emergency lights that have to be on in the building to the perimeter of the building. So it's not a special lighting, it's the organization of the emergency lighting system on the perimeter which lights the building so we could get away with it because you're not allowed to light them. So the building glows because of that technical override. <laughs> Otherwise it wouldn't be able to glow. And then one of the adjustments that was very important was that at the top of Washington's monument, this is a 17 and a half degree pyramid, and I made it exactly the same angle. So that the building and its monuments are somehow different, but absolutely connected. Last project, I hope I'm not exhausting. <laughs> this is a new one. Um, this is a project of kind of an extraordinary commission that I've been given in the last year. Um, 
and this returns back to Africa. Um, and this is a project to uh, to make for um, Nkrumah, um, Nkrumah's plan of Accra, um, the last part of what he called the Dem democratic monumental core, which is to make a sacred space for its democracy. Um, this president, um, Kofuado, who's an amazing president, seen, has had the foresight to kind of want to kind of create this, uh, finish the project that was started by Nkrumah and many presidents have added to it. This is downtown Accra, this is the Atlantic Ocean, this is Black Star Square, which is the heart of the nation where independence was declared. Um, this is a, the old colonial part of the city, um, which has been now taken over, but was the sort of British colonial enclave and then the sort of Africans were lived on the perimeter. So it's a, it's a very contested city in a sense that it was a kind of apartheid city that's now being recolonized. And then the Nkrumah project was to remake and stitch and join the, um, um, the, the two district parts into a kind of unified whole. In the center, um, sort of at this point is parliament um, and that was sort of put next to a, a, a cemetery, a very important sort of memorial cemetery for heroes. And the idea was that this is a kind of important axis to uh, Black Star Square for important celebrations. An important avenue and axis that was made here, uh, this is the sort of main avenue called Liberation Road, and an axis called Cal Castle Road, which brings you to um, the old kind of Accra Castle. This is a Sioux Castle where slaves were taken out of the country, but became the seat of the president. Um, so this really was the kind of monumental triangle of, the, of Accra for a very long time. It has now changed. The president's castle has been moved in, into the city, and this is now going to become a museum. Um, and um, this whole area is being master planned by myself right now. Um, and we are sort of finishing the monumental core by um, placing the cathedral at this head and creating a new sort of cross axis that makes um, parliament here, provides parliament here, a convention center for parliamentarians here, the cathedral here, and then the sort of memorial gardens at this point as a kind of monumental cross core, which then connects to Black Star Square and then to the new plan of the waterfront boardwalk of the city. Um, Ghanaians and a lot of West Africans really have had a traumatic relationship to the sea because of slavery. Um, a lot of people don't understand why the beaches in Ghana or most West African countries, the exception of Dakar and a couple other places, um, are not used. They, well, it's simply a fear of, this was the place where you were captured and taken. And that psyche still is deep in the city ideas of West Africa, that the sea is to be ignored. It's the place where people, you know, uh, go to um, throw away things or get rid of things that they don't want or you know, use it as a kind of toilet almost. And it's really sad because this incredible asset has been sort of, like, there's a kind of turn against it. And we're trying to think about the public life in modern African cities. And one of those is to how to reclaim these incredible waterfront cities and to give them back as assets to the community. So that's part of the master plan that's happening here. But at this point here, um, we were given originally um, four acres to work sort of here with the cathedral and we argued that to complete this landscape, we needed to create um, a new 20 acre park that would um, frame the cathedral and create um, the narrative of this uh, as a sort of landscape a sort of forest landscape with these de democratic um, uh, sort of elements embedded in it. Um, Nkrumah in six years built the modern infrastructure of Ghana, which is astonishing to me and I kind of can't believe it. He, he built the roads, he built Black Star Square, he built all these things. Um, uh, this is Independence Day, sort of January 6th. And that's the kind of uh, the task that the president has sort of given to us is that um, if Nkrumah could build his nation in six years, <laughs> he can build a cathedral in a very short amount of time. I don't even want to say what he wants to do, but, <laughs> but um, and everything else. He's really determined that in his two terms of presidency that he really wants to transform the country and make it a sort of leading, um, a sort of beacon of an African renaissance. Um, the culture of water and of the country moves from wood carving, basket weaving, textiles, goldsmithing, um, di uh, 
huge range of religions from the traditional religions to, to um, Islam, which was introduced in the 16th century um, and its relationship to water. Um, when I was asked to make the space, the building, I, I wanted to see if this notion of a cathedral could be more than just, you know, the idea of a kind of Western notion of a, of a church, which starts in the Middle East, the notion of the cathedral, which is really sort of the origins of the notion of cathedrals in the Christian sense really probably start with the, um, um, the churches in Jerusalem um, that sort of are around the monuments of Christ, the story of Christ. Um, but you can argue that this idea of cathedrals go back to Karnak, Karnak being probably one of the most important cathedrals, first cathedrals uh, to space, to a culture. And I wanted to see if we could make a cathedral which understood that Ghana is now a Christian country, it's 65% Christian and then has animism and Islam, uh, sort of absolutely equal, but all respected. And um, the traditional culture uses kingship and the animist culture are infused and were really the predominant thing until the um, evangel evangelical movements that happened in the 18th and 19th century, which converted the continent. But um, there's this incredible culture of pageantry, of public life and pageantry, which at the 19th century uses, um, sort of earlier before that was about cloths that made sort of ridiculous structures around very important characters in the pageantry. But by the uh, beginning of the 20th century, uses umbrella technology, which is a kind of colonial import, to create these extraordinary, huge sort of temporary tent umbrellas. These are umbrellas that collapse, you know, sort of invented sort of appropriated and sort of makes a kind of tradition called a kind of Bauman tradition where divinity is always under this sort of a tent made under these umbrellas that allow it to be mobile. And it's really part of the psyche of West Africa mostly, but Ghana very specifically. And in, in a way it is where the sort of sacred life of traditional villages or communities sort of articulates itself. So it became for me the kind of foundation for the inspiration for this idea of a cathedral and how to translate this form. And so hold that in your mind. And then secondly, I really wanted to look at West African artists that have sort of really pushed the canon, from my dear friend of mine, Chris Ophili, to um, this incredible artist, Atta Kwame, who's a kind of uh, trained in America, came to Britain, Ghanaian artist, um, working in Ghana and England right now, colorist, incredible colorist, based on thesis. The new generation, people like Lynette Boake, um, and her fiction studies about black lives, modern lives, and Zora Poku, an amazing textile artist that's working now in Ghana, German Ghanaian, through to Ibrahim Mahama and his reuse of um, the containers that took uh, goods away from the continent, and El Atsui, who is remaking, reconfiguring the, 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 what he calls the poisons of um, of the colonial relationship, alcohol, um, plastic, etc., which he weaves back into textiles and makes his art that he sends back into the world. Um, these are the artists that I've gathered who are going to work on this project um, and are in different parts, uh, working in different sort of sections of it. And then, in a way, the sketch probably reveals the whole thing that this idea of this landscape as a kind of um, a sort of arboretheum, a sort of West African ar arboretheum of species with this cathedral, sort of trying to return back to the notion that this is a forest region with a Bauman cathedral, as I call it, <laughs> as I explained, um, as a kind of central sacred form, which then is at the head of this monumental core within the parliament and all the other elements unfolding. The cathedral has to hold 15,000 people, which is huge. Um, so it's really not really a cathedral, it's more sort of, I call it sort of the it's a gathering chamber. And then this notion of the Bauman um, as a axial system and, and uh, sort of trying to see if one could make a, a, um, a column-free um, chamber that could hold 15,000 people. So uh, obviously looking at the engineering excellence uh, of sort of super trust structures um, and this idea of seeing if one could create a narrative where the structure um, unfolds to the center of the, um, of the heart of the plan, um, almost as it were billowing. So in a way to see if we could make concrete behave like fabric. And uh, 
the fabric would be cut into sort of pieces um, that would then articulate to a crescendo in the center. The, the auditorium is very simple. It's an arena which is split with a T um, raked that allows 10,000 people below it and 5,000 people above it on just two cores um, and then allows another 5,000 to be gathered on a podium. The program is basically an, um, a base, a, a very gigantic podium which has museum and all the kind of pieces and then you rise up into the, the, the space of the cathedral. Um, it sort of creates sort of a, a, a strange thing which is that actually the entry to the museum is really at the ground plane but on its axes, it has two large amphitheater-like sets of stairs, which you can climb if you wish, um, <laughs> to an elevated podium. This is above the tree line. You rise up to the height of the tree line. Then you get these extraordinary views across the city. And then you can enter into the, um, uh, the cathedral. And then the cathedral is enclosed in this chamber of glass and this structural trusses, which create this crescendo to the center starting with a compression, which creates a kind of compression as you begin and then unfolds to the center. This is all going to be in concrete. Um, and uh, I sort of describe it. Um, Adam, um, AKT are the engineers who are incredible um, working with us on this uh, extraordinary spanning structure. This is the ground plane where you see how the program unfolds. There's a mausoleum. There's uh, chapels and chambers that you come into, into a heart, and then sort of large stairs that take you up into these two monumental cores which support the mezzanine, but also the kind of key structure and then the uh, arena of the cathedral. And these are the two sort of top parts of the plinth which have these pools which drain, of course, and allows this facade to be disengaged to allow um, 20, uh, uh, what is it? It's uh, 20, 25,000 people to be gathered on top of this podium. And then the roof, which is covered in um, copper, uh, which is a, uh, a copper which you can find very much in Ghana, um, and it covers the concrete with this with this shell. And this is the sort of half cylinder below it. This is the elevation of the of the building, um, and you can see this idea of this plinth that's above the tree line, and and then this idea of this cathedral, which. I think you can start to get a sense of the scale as a kind of monumental soaring space um, in its center, but sort of this compressed space at its perimeter. That's its kind of entrance. And then the section which shows you how the, the, the form rises to the central axis with the highest point. Each one of these concrete slabs is kind of reinforced with a kind of edge beam, which then creates a secondary chamber and creates a ventilating shaft, which allows for uh, the building to be, this is going to be a gold leads building, so it has this, it's water collecting and then also creating this double roof system within its structure. And the sort of the cavity works by cooling the roof here and then creating these hanging concrete sort of blinds, which then shade the inclined glass chambers that allow you to kind of look down onto the park. This is sort of the sort of thinking of the roof. And every time it disengages, it creates a cluster, which is um, actually these concrete planks with very minimal slotted light windows. But we sort of measure, uh, using computers, measure the amount of light that can come in that we can flood the space of light without actually creating huge pieces of glass in the, in the sort of main chamber. This is the idea of the sort of hot top, cool sort of secondary system. And then the kind of axial uh, uh, sort of ventilation system, which creates a stack effects in the, in the building. This is just a kind of early buildup of that. I'll just go to the axial and then the chamber with this, these forms and then the roof as it cascades. And then the site plan, which creates this arboretum. I didn't talk about the landscape too much, but it's this arboretum of uh, spaces where the landscape is really circular, almost like villages of, what I'm calling almost these collections of plant species from the country. So it's really looking at the species in Ghana, native species, which are then collected into this landscape. And then this garden as the sort of space for the community with this cathedral on this podium elevated above it, um, which you then enter. This is going to probably be the largest work by Elan Sui. Um, so El is making this extraordinary 
um, backdrop to this to the chamber. And the form dissolves and illuminates as you as you move through it. And I'll show you a, a quick video. And that's the end of it. Is what hopefully it will look like. That's the end of the question, thank you.